Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, for he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted, even as many were amazed at him. So marred was he, his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been able uh, told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him, was chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shears. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And whom would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned, with, assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with the evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken no falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servants shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardons for their offenses. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the ones who were able to save him from death. And he had heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Glory to 
The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kindred Valley to where there was a garden, and to which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his portrayer, also knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas' betrayer was also with them. When he said, that, said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So that if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? Why don't you be seated now for the balance of the passion? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father in law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas, Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm. And they said to him, you are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, 
a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, would we not have handed him over to you? At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your laws. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone, in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? When he had said this, he went again out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid, and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you, and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench and in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was a preparation day for Passover, 
and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then they handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read the inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, Well, I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who, whose it will be, in order that the passage of the scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When he had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of the week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness had tes- has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, that you also may come to believe. For this happens so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, 
secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it, so he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial clothes along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now, in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So the power of darkness, Jesus is dead. Didn't seem right. We read the gospel today, the passion, and it really sounds like he's in charge as we go through that. He's holding his own. But in the end, Jesus is dead. And I think that we have to, as we ponder this, that started in the first book of the Bible. I read it today to be sure that I had it right. In the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, God creates. There was nothing. And his word spoke and it was created. And it goes through the whole litany of all of the things God created. And after each one, on each day, the Bible tells us God looked at it, and indeed it was good. And we got to day six of creation. Adam and Eve. He created them. And again, it was very good. That was the sixth day, the last day of creation, save the best to last. And then the next day was the day of rest, the Sabbath. And downhill since that, forever. Day three, Cain and Abel are born. And with Cain and Abel come division, hatred, murder, and just as to spin. So this, this creation of this loving God was so marvelous until people came. And then the darkness came. And we spend the rest of the Old Testament trying to figure that out. What was going on? You know, the prophets came. They tried to speak to them. Didn't work for long. Moses, great leader, they rebelled. The prophets chased them out of town. God's people were not willing to listen to their God. And then the great moment of salvation history, the moment we celebrated last night, Passover, uh, and today, with the crucifixion of Jesus the day before, we have this amazing thing that God does this dramatic thing to rescue his people. You know the story. You know, paint your doors with the lintel of the lamb who was slain, and the angel of death will pass by that. Father Bob talked about that last night. The angel of death will pass over that. You'll be saved 
by the Lamb of God. Well, you'd think that that would be wonderful, wouldn't you? And it was for a while, but then it started again. The rebellion. We don't want to do it God's way. We want to do it our way. The prophets preached. They wore themselves out. Didn't get very far, very long. In, the, in today's first reading, I hope it's here. And it's not. In the first reading today, we hear about this mysterious figure. Sounds like a preview of Jesus, really. Tastes right, right? Sounds like a preview of Jesus. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. This is hundreds of years before Christ. Even as many were amazed at him, he so marred was his look beyond human semblance, appearance beyond that of the children of man. Scary looking. But because of him, kings stand speechless. And those who have not been told shall see. And those who have not heard shall ponder it. But who would believe what we heard? This guy grew up like a sapling, a man of suffering, spurned, avoided by people, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hid their faces. But it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. Well, we thought of him as stricken as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Kind of a, a prefigurement of Jesus. So, the power of darkness, attacked by one sent from God to free us from that. And the darkness grew. That's all in the Bible. And it's this wonderful love story of God for us, his people. And I like to think that God finally said, I gotta go there myself. Nobody else is making anything happen. And you remember there was a, some companies put out roadside signs with the witty little things on them, quotes from God. And one of them said, don't make, you know, like a parent would say to his kids, don't make me come down there now. <laughs> well, God finally had to come down here in the, in the person of Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the battle continued. The very beginning of Christ's life, we see the power of darkness in his infancy with Herod trying to kill him. The baby. Darkness isn't stupid. Let's get this guy early. He could be trouble try to kill Jesus. And then we see the, the struggle in the whole life of Christ. He drives out demons. He heals all kinds of diseases. His preaching, his love of sinners, outcasts, lepers. He brings God's love to everyone. The opposition comes in those who refuse to acknowledge the love and power that came from God in Christ. You know, how many times do they accuse him? He's doing this by the, by the power of the devil, just unwilling to hear, unwilling to see. Then the Romans don't want anyone to rock their boat. They've got a nice arrangements with the Jews. You don't bother us, we don't bother you. And all of a sudden, this Jesus, he's, 
he's making waves. So they're not sad when they're going to beat Jesus up and crucify him. That's something they don't have to take care of. The Romans don't. Pilate said it. Take him. Do it yourself. You know, famous wash his hands. And that's what we observe today. That handing over of Jesus to Pilate to be crucified. But even there, in John's Gospel especially, he's in charge. In the very first scene, um, who do you come to see? Jesus. Jesus is I am he. In the words, I am. That figure of God. They all just fall back. Jesus is in charge even of his own crucifixion. That's what we observe this week. This day. So today we reverence the cross by which God chose to finally defeat the darkness. We know how the story ends. We know that it doesn't end in death. Permanently. We know that Jesus was raised from the dead. So our invitation today is to sort of stand in wonder and awe, observing how Jesus showed us the depth of the Father's love for us and his own love for us, so that he willingly gave his life for you and me. And then in a moment, we prayerfully reverence the cross, the instrument of his death, the instrument of our salvation. Prayerfully, we just touch that wood. Someone asked me last night about the triduum, and I hadn't heard that term for a couple of years, and I had to sort of shake my head and remember what it was. But she reminded me that this is the second of the three-phase holy day that's ours. So we started Thursday, today's Friday. We observe today the dying of Jesus, and then tomorrow, his resurrection. But tomorrow is a special gift, I think. Lots of Bible, lots of Bible. And it's wonderful because we Catholics aren't Bible people usually. So it's just wonderful to hear the story from Genesis right up until Easter Sunday about God's love for us, about all, all he does for us. I mean, we just up to the very end, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do before he died. That's our God. So darkness wins this round. Jesus died, but only a temporary victory because by the power of God and for love of us, Jesus is raised from the dead. And that's what we hear tomorrow. In, in Sunday. But the beauty is that we get to review the whole thing and say, all this is for me. All this is to show me how much God loves me. And we really don't need anything more than that to know how much God loves us. Because there is still darkness. An interesting experience to read through the morning paper with a red marker and circle all of those things that show us the darkness, the war, the poverty, all of the creative ways we have of hating each other and putting each other down. Marker was red, all signs of darkness where we have to be touched by God's light and God's love.
So today we share that selflessness of Jesus is giving himself totally for us to manifest his love and the Father's love for us. And then he passes it on tomorrow. You know, sort of tempting you to say, if you don't want the job, don't come tomorrow. But tomorrow he hands it on to us to bring the gospel to our world and our day. That hymn that we'll probably sing tonight, I'm not sure, but it's a lovely hymn. We remember how you loved us through your death and still we celebrate that you are with us here. And we believe that we will see you when you come. We remember, we celebrate, we believe. In this sacred moment, as we dwell on the reality of Christ suffering and dying for us, we now bring special prayer for him and for our world. Let us pray. Dearly beloved, Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Go the next one. Let us pray. Also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Amen. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Cardinal Sean, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts, 
and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offering, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us also pray for all of our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love in his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you have made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and, try, and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in our world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right and sincere, sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God, who treated all pe created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples the assurance of peace and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in the hour of need 
your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Amen. The collection about to be taken up supports Christianity's holiest places and the struggling Christian community in the Holy Land. As always, your generosity will be greatly appreciated. The uh, crosses of the crucifix is about to enter the church again uh, in reverence to the sacred sign of our redemption. We'll come up to the front of the church. Um, three times we'll be invited to sing in prayer. And then um, the clergy will reverence the cross. And then we ask you to come forward from three sides of the church. Middle section are asked to reverence the center section of the cross. Those coming from the sides of the church are asked to reverence their respective side of the arms of the cross. So it stays sort of neat and, uh, and prayerful. Let us stand now and turn to the cross as the cross enters. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the one of the cross 
on which hung the salvation of the world.
he was dying, Jesus spoke to his Father. Let us now speak to the Father, Father of all, as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, for you are Lord forever and ever. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And share with one another a sign of Christ's peace.
Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have, restored, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Son, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 